All right, so next, um, we're going to have Eric Stevens is coming up to talk to us about evaluations conducted at the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, otherwise referred to as GINA. Uh, Eric has over 18 years working as a National Weather Service forecaster and science officer, uh, much of that time in Alaska. His primary responsibilities are to serve as GINA's science liaison and help connect the research and applied sciences of meteorology in Alaska with special emphasis on the development and delivery of new satellite products from university researchers to National Weather Service forecasters. So welcome, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Yeah, that's how to work. El Perfecto. Hey, following on Aaron's nifty uh, presentation about the Iditarod, I was digging around and actually took notes on my hand here so I would know. Actually, I misspoke. The snow depth in Anchorage right now is seven inches. And by the way, it's, it's English units is, you know, centimeters and kilometers. I know we're in the sciences, but the Iditarod route is in English units. Uh, Fairbanks has 13 inches snow depth on ground, and Nome uh, has 25 inches snow depth on ground, but that is modified by a brisk 20 gust 30 knot uh, wind, as is typical. Actually, my first job in the Weather Service full time was in Nome, doing data collection, launching balloons, and that kind of thing. And I learned that measurement of snow depth when climatologically there's an east wind of 30 knots a lot of the time is a highly subjective exercise. And in fact, for this eager young recent graduate from CSU, I wanted to do everything right and I'm out there with my thermometer, you know, measure, because over here you have bare ground and over here is a four foot drift and what is the snow depth? And um, I tried to do my best job and then I saw some of the older crustier guys in the office they made it up, I think. Anyway, beware grad students who are looking back at snow depth data from even first order stations where it's windy because it's highly subjective. Just, just a thought there. And, and speaking of late breaking uh, developments, this is this morning's RAB from Fairbanks. Check out that radiation inversion. And note the, uh, let's see if we got an arrow here. It is calm at the surface. There, it's five below at the airport here, 20 above in the hills around Fairbanks. These are the inhabited elevations. And so a 25 degree temperature range at time equals now where people live. So what do you, whatever you tell them will be considered wrong by most of the population. This is the microclimate um, issue. And uh, moving on, oops, let's go the other way. Here's uh, the barrel rab from this morning, and cold air loft is one of the uh, JPSS applications we found. Um, and up at that tippy top of the troposphere there, we do uh, get a little chillier than that 65 below threshold, which is, we can't get too bogged down in cold air loft. But just wanted to say that the weather never stops, and happily, neither does JPSS. But even while we are here, um, there is, there is real-time applications and need for, for these tools and techniques. So um, I've already eaten into my time unexpectedly. Just there's Alaska, nice Mercator projection, which uh, makes us uh, look bigger than it actually is. But my wife told me that, so Eric, you're going to Texas, so at least that state's small enough that you can't get lost, uh, which is true. So what is GINA? Um, GINA uh, collaborates with NOAA. It's an acronym, as NOAA is known to do. Um, Geographic Information Network of Alaska, part of UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks. We have two antennas, um, which makes that an antenna farm, uh, receiving data from a number of polar orbiting weather satellites, including SNPP for years, and now we're getting set up with NOAA 20, uh, starting to grab some of that data. Um, it's the CSPP software that allows us to turn that raw data into something that a meteorologist will use in the operational context. I'd like to think that, you know, Gina, we're a small fish in, in a big ocean of scientists and researchers. And without collaborations with, with SIMS and CIRA and NASA Sport and so many others, we couldn't do what we do. We apply in an Alaskan context a lot of the work that is developed elsewhere. 
and so partnerships are so important. So then we have something useful and we hand it to the weather service, the LDM, the local data manager, that's the back door. And this, or, or FTP for non-AWIPS users, non-weather service folks, and this gets us to minimizing latency. That's already come up here, but even the best product doesn't do a forecast or any good if it arrives too late to be used. And then my talk is about evaluations of new products. So it's one thing to grab data, turn it into a product, and deliver it. But you can't just stand on the victory podium now. Podium now. You're not done yet. Um, how can new products best be introduced usefully into the forecast process? And there's a lot of talk about the R to O process, research into operations. And ideally, though, also operations back into research. And the wheel always turns. Michael just, uh, in his final slide there, had a lot of great feedback from forecasters on how products can be improved. So now, like a game of tennis, the ball goes back and forth. And ideally, though, we're, we're always getting better at what we're doing and making things more helpful. Alaska is big. This is one of those required slides. Um, Alaska Region Weather Service personnel operate on the synoptic scale, even though, as we saw in the first sounding from Fairbanks, you have micro scale uh, terrain influenced effects. But those are the county warning areas that the uh, quilted pattern over the lower 48, and then superimposed is what the there are three forecast offices in Anchorage, uh, similar staffing profile to lower 48 uh, offices. But you have to think synoptically, and so you don't have a lot of time sometimes to uh, focus on things. I remember coming home from work and my, my long-suffering spouse would say, so Eric, is it, gonna, you know, is it gonna snow tomorrow or not in Fairbanks? And I'm just shell-shocked from a double shift because there's a Bering Sea buzzsaw or something on, you know, eating up the West Coast. And I wrote the Fairbanks forecast in 45 seconds. I don't even remember what it was. But, you know, you, you send the fire trucks to where the fires are. And when you have a big area, there's, there's always something, maybe multiple difference in the things happening. So this is what forecasters have to deal with in Alaska, and there's no observational data. Um, this is the radar network in Alaska, and seven radars is better than none. It would have been none except for uh, a powerful senator that Alaska had back in the day, but we have these. This just demonstrates the importance of satellite data, especially up in Alaska where, thanks to the high latitude, we get more frequent coverage from uh, the polar orbiters. So polar orbiters, yes, they feed numerical models. They directly improve numerical model performance. But why are we here now, too? Part of it is to find ways to apply JPSS data in near real time in a surveillance sense in products designed to be interrogated by humans. And so that's what we're, we're doing. We're finding ways to use that data. Uh, here's a GO-16 loop uh, supplied, I believe, by Dan Lindsay showing you can see Alaska up here, this is before they moved uh, um, GO-16 to its eastern position. So we can, you can barely see there's a Kodiak Island there. But that's one of the challenges with geostationary is just the look angle when you're at a high latitude there. And so it's much better when you have something like this. This is a, a true color image of Alaska. Just nothing special meteorologically here, but just to show the advantage of looking directly from overhead. You don't have the parallax and pixel broadening issues that you do from geostationary. They both play a role, certainly. I'm not here to, to oh, and we can't wait for GOES S, GOES 17. That's going to be beautiful for, for us. So, okay, JPSS helps us out, but the pesky follow up questions. Um, you can, the number, especially of multispectral products, is almost theoretically boundless, depending on how creative you want to be. Even now uh, at CIRA, uh, Steve Miller and Curtis Seaman have this new product that's not quite an RGB. It uses kind of a transparency approach as well as uh, image band combination. This is, and how many ingredients, okay, Jarrell, you're the CIRA or CSU guy on here. Do you know how many channels go into that new snow cloud discriminator product? It's like seven or eight or something are in there. Yeah, there's a lot in there. So just start to do your factorials. You can make any number of products. So which ones are going to be useful? And always in Alaska, things are different. So you got to watch out for gotchas up there when you're introducing new products. And um, there's always logistics. Even today, right now, for years, Gene has been delivering uh, SNPP imagery in AWIPS ready format to weather service forecasters in Alaska. Spatial resolution one kilometer. 
it could be 375 or 750, but we had to coarsify it because of these infrastructure concerns, which is being worked on. Um, in this year, 2018, hopefully, with the tile approach being developed at, at Wisconsin, we're going to deli deliver the full resolution. Forecasters are already familiar with some stuff, but what if you have um, really new radical stuff? One time I was at a training session at Weather Service Anchorage, and during a break, when most of the important conversations happen is during the breaks, a forecaster pulled me aside and kind of quietly he said, you know, Eric, I've been doing this job for almost 30 years, and we've had visible imagery, long wave IR, and, and not much else. That's kind of what we use. And what am I going to do with 22 channels of veers? Like he did, and he felt ashamed. It was like he was confessing to me this, that he didn't already know what to do with all these extra bands. Well, how would you know? Um, I, I felt bad that he felt bad, and that's one of the roles that we have in the community is to make people feel, to get through that uncomfortable breaking in period for your new pair of hiking boots, that we get right in as quick as we can to, oh, this is familiar territory for folks. Well, luckily there are answers. I think the satellite, it's easy for me to say this, but the liaison program I think has been an effective way to help accelerate the adoption of these new t tools and techniques into the into the DNA of forecasters so that they don't have to think too hard about it. Um, and imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I've learned a lot from the other satellite liaisons and the cooperative institutes, uh, the value of in-person and remote training, um, the reference materials like the quick guides. So Sport made some quick guides a few years ago. It was the first time I had seen that. And I went to the Anchorage Weather Service office one time. And in a couple of the cubicles tacked to the wall of a cubicle were the Sport quick Here at the mouth of the Yukon River, those are these. This is a, a new RGB that has those components in it. We've just introduced those successfully to the fire service in 2017. Got great response from that. And again, uh, fire temperature RGB. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rush through some of this because the last thing. What I want to say about those fire products is, in these should have been in routine use by the fire service in 2016. They weren't because I think I made a mistake. I assumed that the only way a product is useful is if it's in AWIPS. Well, guess who used to work at the weather service? It was me. Everything's in AWIPS. It's got to be good. Well, at the fire service, they have a AWIPS thin client. It's not quite AWIPS. And we, we spent a lot of time bashing our heads against logistical issues getting products in there. Well, CSPP's polar to grid can also spit out GeoTIFF format files at full resolution. And we started to feed those to the fire service via our just experimental, you know, uh, FTP site. And they got a hold of that stuff and gobbled it up, per the quote in happy green there. Huge fans. Jennifer Jenkins is not a meteorologist, and, but she needs to help the rest of the fire community with perimeter mapping of where the fires are, how, how they've grown, and such. And note that even she sees this distinction between I and M bands because of spatial resolution. This person is not a meteorologist, but she loves it. And she provides briefings to other folks who are also not meteorologists but need to know where the fire is, how much it's grown, if it's moving, intensity, things like that, and these new products do deliver that. I, the lesson I took from this is that it's not all about AWIPS. AWIPS is important for the weather service, but if you want to serve other users, there are other product formats that are necessary. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just accelerate through some of this to say, okay, yeah, what is a successful assessment? 
Well, hopefully we all just stand, stand around and congratulate each other, right? But um, you need to hear bad news if we want to make improvements. Uh, one thing we learned about new caps uh, that, that Michael mentioned is it's so latent when it comes over the SBN and the AWIP, so we can't use the thing. So, aha, uh -huh, we've identified a problem. Frustrating, but this is good to know because now we can move forward to fixing that. And, um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. sorry, I got to move on. There was uh, some good feedback and some bad feedback regarding a, a deliberate sea ice assessment that Carl Dierking at GINA uh, went, led the weather service through this spring. Oops, let's go back there. AMSER 2, you can see that highlighted here, and we're looking forward to AMSER 2 being, um, we want to develop that in a way that can deliver AWIPS ready imagery. And I, I perhaps I'm not totally fault up on the latest version of CSPP there, but that's, the forecasters want that because of increased spatial resolution. Um, and then, since we were working with some of the new products from the, the CRIS and ATMS, that's more than just for CS applications, so we introduced a lot of new things. There are two ways to introduce a product. One is a formal assessment where you set up a website that has maybe a Google Forms on there and, and you do some uh, training in person or asynchronous with videos, YouTube videos, things like that. Very deliberate, get feedback. The problem is that takes a lot of work to do. This is not easily done. Of course it should be done. I mean, we should all be at the perfect height and weight and, and our, our garage should be organized. I mean, I know these things should be done, but in reality, you got to pick your battles. So a lot of the products you want to, you kind of throw them over the fence. And I know that phrase is not embraced, nor should it be. But you, if you're going to introduce 20 new products in a given year, you really got to focus just on one or two or three to be very deliberate and, and focused on. And the other ones, you kind of just hope they come along as collateral damage or collateral benefit, perhaps. And then you plan for the next year, depending on what feedback you get from forecasters on things they're interested in or needs they've expressed. Maybe then you do, like the Cold Air Loft product was introduced because of an expressed need by weather service forecasters. And, and so that can help us focus in on which of these myriad possible things to deliver is most helpful right now. And also, it's nice to, I know I'm going into overtime here. Um, when you introduce something new, in my personal opinion, I try to anchor the new product to something that forecasters are familiar with. Again, what if someone has been in the weather service 30 years and they use long wave IR? Well, here's a long wave IR. Um, image. This is an AVHARR example, or I'm sorry, um, we have a Veers long wave IR here. And now let's throw on a, uh, this is total precipitable water on top of that. So, ah, you can see where you might expect the precipitable water it lines up mostly well. The cirrus on the long wave IR is a little further um, making landfall, but the actual, whoops, moisture is not quite there yet. And then you can throw on top of that a rain rate. Um, so what we're doing here is you start with something people are familiar with and you, then you introduce some newer things to compare and contrast and maybe show, because there's no one perfect product. You know, it, who's me, what auto mechanic has a toolbox with one wrench in it? I mean, you need lots of tools uh, and for different situations and it's good to know where the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and new caps, boy. At Barrow, right now, we've met the threshold up at the tropopause of, of colder than minus 65. Just this week, NASA Sport, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Emily Barrett, is facilitating another assessment, uh, a very deliberate assessment of, of the cold air loft and new caps uh, capabilities up in Alaska. And uh, what we're doing also with new caps, speaking of new caps, and it's so good to, again, you learn from others. We're trying to find ways to apply new caps since F5 tornadoes tend not to occur in Alaska. Um, we want to find ways, though, for the, the pre severe wildfire environment. Can new caps help us anticipate those days when wildfires might break loose and, and just chew up the landscape? And maybe new caps could help us fill in those temporal and spatial gaps between the rayobs. Um, latency has been a problem also these last couple of years. We haven't really burned much. Uh, we've delegated the burning to California this year. But um, maybe uh, in the 2018 season there might be more there. And you know what? One thing we haven't really trained folks on is because we're not short fuse convectively oriented though is fidelity and skill in, in messing with the boundary layer of a new caps uh, profile. I think we'll pro I'll probably be bugging you, Michael, about how 
do you think I could introduce those ideas to forecasters in Alaska who, honestly, they just aren't familiar with doing that? And so that'll be, I think, a way we can make those products more useful for folks. Speaking of cold air loft, this is from about a year ago. One day I walked into the Center Weather Service unit there in the FAA bunker in Anchorage, and this was up on their, their situational awareness monitor. Huge, you know, like 50-inch screen. And that purple hatch over southeast Alaska, there's an area of cold air loft without SNPP, without the Proving Ground and the Liaison Program. I don't think uh, that hazard would have been noted for the FAA uh, briefers who are guiding the pilots. So that's an important thing. And close again with the best logo in the world, polar bears and palm trees. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you.